I would like to, in advance of the program, also thank our sponsors, our very generous sponsors, uh, including the Lowell Institute, Mass Cultural Council, the Barr Foundation, the Nellie Mae Education Foundation, and our partners here at Suffolk University, uh, which serves as the forum's home base. We also encourage you to visit our restaurant sponsor, the Woodward at the Ames Hotel, after the forum. And finally, we want to thank our members in the audience and, and out there whose generosity makes our free public events possible. If you're not yet a member, please check us out at forthallforum.org, or there's an information table outside before you leave. Um, so I will introduce uh, Mr. Lobel and let him introduce uh, our guests uh, again when Taylor gets here. But I do want a, a special thank you to Chris and, and Taylor as well uh, for agreeing to, to come in and speak to me. Eastwood talking to the empty chair. <laughs> <laughs> you said what? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Our moderator tonight is Bob LaBelle, uh, someone who doesn't really need an introduction, I think, in this town, but I'll do one anyways for him. Uh, he's a sportscaster, was a sportscaster for WBZ for almost 30 years. He anchored the sports segments on the evening newscasts uh, between Sunday and Thursday and hosted weekly programs, Sports Final, and the Patriots Fifth Quarter. Mr. LaBelle has also done play-by-play -play work for the Boston Marathon, the Boston Celtics, the Boston College Eagles, the New England Patriot preseason games, and the NFL. Prior to, prior to joining WBC. That's good enough. Yeah? <laughs> well, you know, really. We do know who he is. All right, a man with no introduction. We really want to thank you, Bob. He's, he's host, co hosts a radio show in New Hampshire. Yeah, uh, actually. And uh, I want to thank you for, for joining us tonight, Bob. I'm uh, very honored to be here. Thanks. Uh, be seated. Thanks. Uh, I just have to tell you a quick story before I get here, or before we get into the program. So I, I have a 17-year-old daughter, okay? Nightmare. Okay. 17-year-old <laughs> daughter who is, is a senior in high school in Dover and is, you know, applying to colleges, which of course just ups the ante and ups the stress. And is so today, you know, she asked, uh, if she could borrow one of my credit cards, because she has one of the, my other credit cards, uh, and the one that she has doesn't, the university says she's applying to doesn't take, so I says, yeah, it's out in my car where the other, where I always keep it, in my wallet. So she takes my, she, what she did, for some unexplained reason, was to take not just the credit card, but my wallet inside, and, uh, you know, I'm, Figuring the wallet's in the car, and I'm driving halfway to Boston. I'm on the Mass Pike, and I'm looking for my wallet. You know, so all of a sudden I realize she's got it, or I call her up. You know, anyway, I'm saying I have no credit cards, I have no money, I have no license. I have. I'm going to have to take a collection for parking. I'm going to. You don't have to start now. That's all right. <laughs> and. It's a nightmare. I mean, what happens if I get into an accident? I did, you know what? I just can't get into an accident. I don't have anything except the clothes I'm wearing. So it's like, you know, 17-year-old daughters. It's, it, they are who they are. So that's, under those circumstances, I navigated the big dig and, and ended up here. Not the easiest place to find, as you might know, and, you know, Thanks to Jennifer, who stopped cars and allowed me to back down the street and, you know, found a place. Anyway, it was, was not that easy a situation. But here we are. And uh, I really, it's, this is like concussion week for me because last Saturday I was at a seminar up in New Hampshire. It was like, it, it was more than a seminar. It was, for lack of a better word, an event where Riddell and other helmet makers were there. Uh, Steve Nelson was there as well, and I interviewed him about concussions, and I've talked to Grogan in the past, I've talked to Tim Fox in the past, you know, safety who, you know, that position is clearly uh, susceptible to a uh, head-to-head, -head. and he was no, you know, sh uh, you know shrinking violet. Fox. So all these guys have had experience with concussions. Fox was very worried about his memory. He said he could feel it. 
well, he's a pretty young guy. I mean, he's, you know, maybe he's in his 50s or whatever. But he's a pretty young guy, and he said, you know, maybe he's overreacting, but he just pays very close attention to what he can't remember and what he can remember. Here's a guy who went to Ohio State, played for Woody Hayes, and was a safety for the Patriots and for the Rams uh, or San Diego. And, you know, he was a hard hitter. He was known as a really tough guy. And uh, a lot of that... A lot of that stuff back then, first of all, helmets were a lot different, and the whole game was a lot different. And as you said, Chris, they were, they were not, you know, count the number of fingers I have up. You know, what day is it? Okay, you can go back in the game. Because all these guys, you're, you're all sick in one way. You all want to play. You know, you all say, I'm okay. I'll go back in the game. It's what they do. It's, it's who they are. And they haven't done themselves... But I'll tell you one thing I did learn up there, and we can talk about this, was that concussions, at least in football, uh, there were a couple doctors that were part of the panel. Uh, and it happened to Steve Nelson in Green Bay. He said he, was, he had one major concussion in Green Bay where he couldn't remember where he was, uh, who, you know, they, they put him in the hospital overnight. But it happened when he was hit from the side that helmets really don't, prevent concussions, that it's the, it's the twisting of the neck and the side hits that do the most damage. Like head-to-head -head contact, like Joe Mays did against Matt Schaub. I don't know if you saw that hit. Oh, yeah. It was just totally vicious, vicious hit. Uh, uh, but it was head-to-head, -head and Schaub lost a piece of his ear, of all things, and he came back in the next play. I mean, you know, it's just unbelievable. But I, I'd like to to talk about, especially in, in wrestling, where so much of the stuff, first of all, you're not protected, but there's, no, there's nothing really that can protect you from swiveling, which is really the, the issue, right? Right, so yeah, uh, adding helmets to football made it dangerous in a new way to the brain that we didn't have before, and that was the idea. We put the helmets on, not because of concussions, because people were dying of skull fractures. And then when we added the helmet, what we did was open up the ability for you to hit somebody in the head as hard as you possibly can with your head and deliver what's been measured into the hundreds of Gs of force. And what happens is helmets do a really good job preventing linear force if your brain doesn't twist. But if it twists, which is in almost every situation, it's not really reduced. I saw something pass along the other day about they reduces maybe 10 to 20 percent of that energy. And so... Uh, you opened up the door to just so many more rotational blows of the hits that you would have died from or really complained about before. And so now it's created a whole new problem. And I think, you know, the, the Schaub hit, uh, which I think most football fans saw, was just another example of the disaster that is treating concussions at the professional level. Right. Um, because, as you said, he was back after one play. And that's a, a you know, just, just to throw it out there as an early talking point of just how wrong it is out there. You know, those of you who saw the hit, he Shaw threw the ball, got blindsided helmet to helmet. It was so hard it clipped his earlobe and ripped it off. And he was bleeding and they could see it was gone. And so when he was down on the ground holding his both sides of his head for a good minute, you know, just in obvious pain, be, thank God he was bleeding because that allowed him to say, oh, he's, he's holding his head because of the earlobe, not because of his brain, which is, you know, it it's, uh, should be illegal to make that assumption. You see a guy hold his head, yeah. even if you find a cut, they still have to evaluate him for concussion. So it's funny that the uh, players get fined for stuff, but the NFL team was not fined for not evaluating him. Right. Which is the way it should be. I mean, it's, they think they've come a long way, and I, I suppose that they have, but they're, you're leading a double-edged sword here. Yeah. You know, they're selling the product. Uh, the product is, um, is important to them. Uh, rough play is important to them. These guys are taught uh, everything that to do. Taylor, you can come on up. Frank, good to see you, man. Ladies and gentlemen, Taylor Twelman. How are you? Fix, just gonna fix your car. Hi, Hi. Hi. Nice to see you. Still? You still got those things or what? I still have them, yeah. The? I know. Taylor and Come I were kind of... I know. Hey, look, if I could get off of my wood, I don't like... <laughs> you know what? I, somebody could steal them and then it'd be great. But then I'd have to figure out what to do. But yeah, Taylor, uh, we kind of went to the same rehab place. Didn't kind of. We, we did. Yeah, we were there many times. And uh, 
we had lots of lots of conversations. Taylor's uh, uh, you know, a great star. Was a great star with uh, in the MLS. He did a fabulous commentary on the World Cup. I just thought you guys were really uh, sensational. And uh, thank you. It was great. It, it was, was fun. It was great stuff. And I, I, it's amazing how between what you've been able to accomplish as a player uh, through the MLS and uh, the way that the MLS has grown. I mean, it, it hasn't been an overnight no. awareness, but it's, co it's come along. And I, we all can tell that th people are much more aware of the Premier League and much more aware of everything that's going on. And, and they you know, spend a lot more time with, with soccer than they ever th thought about doing 20 yeah. years ago. Well, and I, I think Chris and I have actually talked about it as well. I think a lot of it is, you know, the different generations now playing the game. You yeah. see the numbers of kids playing soccer, but yet it's kind of forgotten on the topic of concussions, which is what Chris and, you know, football and hockey get the headlines. But the fact is the numbers, more kids are playing soccer, and there, we still have the injury of concussions as well. But soccer's growing, Bob. It's huge. Here's, here's the fact that I found out last week that was just stunning to me that Women's soccer mm -hmm. is the thing they're probably the most concerned about in the, in, in the way of concussions. And I don't want to, we're not here to scare parents or anybody, but there's a reason for that. Uh, and I guess it's elbows. I guess it's hitting the ground. I, yeah. I, I, maybe the, genetically, you, though, w women have something a little bit different than we do in our necks. And um, Chris could probably talk more about that, or, you know, neither of us are doctors, but. They, they have, they're more prone to concussions because of, you know, something between their skull and where it sits on. So they really have more brains. Than yeah, we well, do, that's right? bigger, well, bigger brains. Are we brain stating the obvious? Part of the problem. I don't think, I that's, we're we're the I don't think that's ever been <laughs> right, honey? challenged, right? Uh, no one's ever challenged that. No, there was an interesting study on, ne on neck strength that found they, and I can't imagine how they got this through the IRB, but they put a one kilogram weight wrapped around someone's head attached to a little pulley. When they weren't looking, they would drop it. It would jerk their head. Really? And what they found is that in the pre-studies, the, the women's necks were about 30% thinner, and they were about 30 to 40% weaker. And what that led to was about 40% more movement and 50% more energy to the brain. So the same hit caused 50% more energy to the brain. So that, that, kind of, yep. that little study kind of shows why women are at so much more risk. But also small children, because that neck weakness thing happens. They're small boys, yeah. you know. So the younger the girl, that's even a worse situation. Truly, that to me was really fascinating. Um, you know, between lacrosse, which has become an extremely popular sport, and between you know football, which is football, and it's all about teaching. As Steve Nelson, I was talking, uh, I was with Steve Nelson last weekend mm -hmm. at a uh, yeah. concussion seminar up in Manchester, New Hampshire. And uh, he was talking about, he said, if you want to play football, you got to ha learn how to do it the right way. You can't put your head down. you got to keep your head up. It's just, I know you say that, but there's so <laughs> many. Oh, no, but I mean, what's the difference where you're looking if you're getting <laughs> hit in the head? No, that's, <laughs> right. I mean, it's, you know, he's trying to just. Yeah, but if your head's up when you get hit by a car, it's different. <laughs> I mean, that's a neck injury thing. It's not a brain injury thing. <laughs> yeah. So, well, so talk a little bit more about the, the soccer. Well, I. I'll give you a little bit of my, um, I've had seven diagnosed concussions um, from age 14 on. Uh, when I started dealing with post-concussion syndrome, I, you know, really asked for some help from my mom and, you know, father because I wanted to know my total concussion diagnosed history. Chris and I have had these discussions, but, so I've had seven from age 14 and on. My last one was uh, August 29th, 2008. Uh, was never diagnosed with a concussion. Um, I passed the impact test 78 out of 78 times. Uh, was diagnosed with diabetes, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, which because I didn't go to England and I was playing in New England. So I, I've been through the whole thing as an athlete. I've seen it. Um, soccer scares me because over the last two to three years, I've gone to probably about 100 under, to nine, under 9 to under 14 soccer practices. And they'll head the ball five, six, seven times each per practice. Then I'll go to that game. There's one head ball maybe in that game. And so when I saw Chris, I don't know, what was it, a year ago maybe, in January Almost, or something yeah. like that? I said, 
don't you find it funny we're teaching kids how to head the ball at such a young age, but scientifically we know that our brains aren't fully developed age, well, you know, females, it's uh, 12, 13, whatever, we're a little right, older, but whatever. Don't document that. that, right? So why are we heading the ball? You know, we talk about Pop Warner football, hockey, and all these cool. sports. Because it's cool. Right. Because it's cool. But you go to Barcelona, you go to Real Madrid, the two best clubs in the world, arguably, right now, they maybe head the ball twice in practice. So there is a byproduct to this, Bob, because you still can learn how to head the ball when your brain's fully developed at age 14 and 15, but the byproduct is you become better soccer players with the ball at your feet. And I'm concerned right now that we have parents out there that are uneducated, unaware of the situation, coaches. They're punting the ball in the air, which is a totally different force than if my nine-year-old cousin, daughter, whoever's heading the ball from another nine-year-old. They kick the ball a lot different. So that's kind of why I'm here and kind of following Chris's footsteps and just education and awareness because I don't think we're really educated yet. You know, I laugh when they say, well, if you tackle with your head up, listen. <laughs> Yeah. You run as fast as you want into a wall, whether your head's up or not, you're still going to get yeah. a concussion. So, you know, there's, it's a double-edged sword. Plus, not, not only to talk about just hitting the ball, if, if you're in a position in a game and you're a youngster, there may be two or three people also trying to head the ball at the same time. Well, and that's a good point, Bob. None of my concussions were from heading the ball. They were all from collisions. Really? You know, and I want to make that known that no. I'm not saying that heading what caused kind of concussions. Co what kind of collisions? Are just <laughs> oh, but do we have a I video mean, here? No. Yeah, how about I we, usually have it. it. <laughs> <laughs> we run into my fist. <laughs> you, know, you know, soccer players notably <laughs> flop. Yeah, no, we don't. Come on, I've seen it. <laughs> never do. I'll, I'll flop in the next no. 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. <well that's> <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I ran into the goalie uh, from my last one. I, uh, he punched me in the face. So, I mean, it was hardcore collisions. But, I, you know, as I'm skeptical now on the situation, what if I didn't head the ball for a long time and maybe it wasn't, maybe that concussion doesn't last me for the rest of my life like that one will. So I'm just trying to, you know, be a positive influence on what can we do to help people not be like me. Yeah, it reminds me of a story. We, uh, my book was made into a movie called Head, Head Games that came out uh, last great, weekend. Great movie. You saw it? Yep. Oh, thanks. Um, opened in New York and L.A. last week, playing at Boston Common October 5th. Good, Go fantastic. But, but uh, we did a screening in Chicago in June, and Cindy Parlow Cohn plays a big yep. role in this, who's fantastic, uh, and talks about the fact she saw stars hundreds of times. Seeing and stars is a big deal. Yeah. And we're not talking about He's not talking about looking at me. No, I know. I said, <laughs> I need to. <laughs> No, but, you know, seeing stars is a yeah. big deal when they talk about it. And so we're Tom Nelson afterwards. talked about it too. He's yeah. seeing stars. And so we're talking afterwards, and it's me and Cindy, and this, this uh, woman who played in, through college, late 20s, and she was kind of like white after seeing the movie. And, and she started just kind of unloading, and she said, you know, it's so, it's so scary to see that because, you know, I don't really feel like myself now, but I never really had a ton of diagnosed concussions. But I look back, and I remember being so angry about heading the ball when I was six that I refused to do it and I ref and I would throw tantrums every time they tried to make me practice it but they eventually did it and they eventually I uh, eventually became good enough that I was able to get a scholarship out of it and I must have had the ball 20,000 times mm. and it reminded me that six-year-olds are tend to be smart enough to get their head out of the way of a projectile until we force them to do it like they would not be heading unless we thought it was a good idea kids would never throw their head in front of that object no. And you just kind of think about how, uh, you know, where these kind of skills come from and, and rules of the game. They come from this, the adult games that are probably not appropriate for children. No, but it, 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 and it's actually, I'm glad you brought this up. Sydney Parlow was part of this University of North Carolina phenomenon where they won every national championship for a long time. And they were talking, and I saw her and a couple ex-teammates, and they talked about at the end of every practice, the the coach would make the goalie punt the ball in the air. The two center forwards and the four defenders would have to challenge 10 to 20 goal kicks a day in practice. That is literally like Tom Brady hiking the ball, taking a three to five step drop and having the linebackers run up and you got to avoid it. And when I think of that and Sydney Parler goes, you know, and she'll look at you and go, I, I can't believe I have concussions. I'm like, really? Yeah. You know, and that was the number one college in the, in the world for women's soccer. And they were practicing useless head balls that it's honestly, 
it's coming to a point. FIFA right now is a little bit, it's not a little bit, they're, they won't talk about it because they don't believe in it, right? Shot. They think it's all about elbows and stuff like that. But imagine if Sydney Parlow never practiced a headball until she was 14. FIFA is the uh, international governing body for um, the world in soccer. And, and uh, as a, my FIFA experience is last uh, summer, I won an Eisenhower Fellowship and was able to travel Europe for five weeks to try to build collaborations on head injury research and meet with different sports organizations. And everyone met with me except for FIFA. With six months notice and very senior people around Europe saying, you know, please meet with him. They wouldn't do it. Uh, so I think the fight over headers is going to be bigger than the fight over that we had with the NFL, and I really look forward to it. Yeah, I'm glad you do. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know. I think these governing bodies, uh, FIFA or the IOC, or they're they're a country unto themselves. I mean, they have so much power and so much influence and so much money, really, that they don't want to deal with this stuff. They they think they got a good product going, and they're they're going to. I assume. It, even it's true. In the Olympics, you know, there was a, even the, the women's soccer this year, they were, the, mm -hmm. we played, did you see this? They, we played somebody in one of the games and we knocked out their goalie unconscious. Yep. And there's all these pictures of her out and our people standing over her. And she'd stayed in the game against every international regulation ever in the history of time. And nobody even reported on it except for a couple of blogs. So they, uh, well, and then, I, and then I go to Twitter, here. right? Yeah. And I'm like, that's a concussion. And people are like, you're a wimp, whatever. And I'm like, really? Yeah. Her right arm goes numb. You know, she's, her head hits the ground. Austin Collie last year, the NFL. Yeah. You know, he gets hit blatantly. And right. People are like, well, that's what the NFL's about. I don't know. Well, that's the mentality. I mean, you're fighting that mentality. I, is, it, is it me or is it just warm in here? It's very warm. I don't know if there's any way of, huh? The lights? Pretty used to lights. I don't remember them being this, <laughs> this warm. Maybe I'm just not right. I know that's always possible. I wouldn't panic about it if it just seems like it's a little warm. It's warm in here. Yeah, I mean, there's no lights in the audience, so you guys are warm. No, I'm not going to take it, huh? I will, uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. You know, too vain. Uh, so, where do we where do we go from here? I s and I, I think we need to l let you know that there are microphones on either side. Yeah, because I think we need to uh, involve the audience as much as possible because um, we, can, we can sit here and talk. But certainly if you have a question or an observation, just feel free to walk up there. Thanks. Good. Here we go. Takes the, always takes just one. Sir Taylor, I don't know much about soccer, but are we going to see helmets in soccer? Um, and what about... Banning heading, is that in the cards? Good question. It's a good question. Um, I don't think we'll ban heading, which is why I've kind of looked at it. Chris will love the battle with FIFA. I don't want to go through that, but I'm going to try to do my best to give the kids a better opportunity so when they are older playing that they gave their brains an opportunity. I do think there may be at some point some restrictions on heading at the youth level. That's kind of what my, I hope for. Uh, but helmets, uh, I'll answer your question with another question. If helmets took away concussions, then why does the NFL have concussions? I think yeah. we talked about that before you got here. Chris talk, you know, talked a little bit about the dramatic yeah. skull fracture type injuries, but maybe, you know. Well, the worst part, you talked about it, right? When we've talked about this, when you put on a helmet, you feel a little, well. Right. Right? Yeah. So it, I well, can't imagine. If soccer had helmets, what the, our sport would be like that? I can tell you what it would be, like, football. I, I tell you yeah. be like. It's be like hockey. Yeah. And these guys are bigger, faster, stronger, and now they have shoulder pads and helmets that allow them to do what they want to do. Yep. And if they had, if you went back to the no helmets, and then and the, the first of all, they had great haircuts back in the day. <laughs> yeah, dude. Much less back shoulder pads. You know, much less because a lot of their shoulder pads are like they're like granite. Uh, uh, but if you went back to the more leather type equipment, I think a lot of the problems would be eliminated in hockey because they wouldn't be so aggressive. But right now, everybody thinks they can be as, as rollerball. Everybody thinks they can be, as, and the speed generated because they took out the red line 
in the middle, which they tried to make it a faster game. It's made it a faster game, but it's made it a much more dangerous game. I'm not trying to scare you, but in, I, I don't think it, that's the uh, issue on uh, college or high school levels, but it is in the National Hockey League. I mean, you, it's, a, it's a dangerous game in the National Hockey League. So I, I hope we don't see helmets in soccer because I know it's not going to get rid of them. Do all your injuries come from, all your head injuries come from heading? Or were you no, I was, I was kicked in the face, punched in the face. I was, it was never just from the act of heading the ball, no. There About, was a collision. Were these accidents or were these intentional on the way here? Well, it depends. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Um, it depends on who you ask. Well, I'm asking you. <laughs> uh, my last one was not 100% intentional, but it was not 100% accident because the goalkeeper came out late and he knew he screwed up. Really? Yep. But that's part of the game. I'm no, no hard feeling. See, there you go. That's all part of the you know what? I mean, I've got a voodoo doll of him in my bedroom. <laughs> I haven't gotten over it. It was only four years ago. <laughs> and about female athletes, there's a great uh, body of evidence showing that women athletes suffer knee injuries about five or six times more frequently than, than men. So women are different than men. That's not a newsflash, though. In many areas. <laughs> no, you're, you're right. <laughs> you don't hear much about this, no complaints or feminists hollering about this or calls for federal legislation, which leads to my next question. What about federal legislation? Do we want big government coming in on sports and handing down? Okay, we have a gentleman behind you that also. And, and, and over here. What I was saying here, it's uh, now uh, 107 years since football was saved by Theodore Roosevelt. And uh, I don't know if people saw today, uh, Jim McMahon at age 53 has uh, come down with uh, uh, early dementia. I did see that today. Yeah. Jim McMahon was a quarterback for the Chicago Bears, was quite a character, but that had nothing to do with his dementia, of course. That's a side note. And those who saw this, not necessarily was head injury, but those who saw the uh, video of uh, Earl Campbell um, when he uh, received his uh, award uh, from his team uh, and uh, see this a uh, man who was, I think, 47 at the time, looked about 90. Um, and um, something has to be done. And I wonder if you people would just talk a little bit about government involvement. Um, and I know everyone these days says, oh, we got to get government out, get government out, get government out. But I think until we have someone like uh, uh, a Theodore Roosevelt stand up and, and, and really call uh, owners and uh, sponsors to task here, we're not going to see uh, the technological developments that need to happen uh, because these these uh, individuals are bigger, faster, stronger, and it's only going to get more exaggerated. So, well, you know, Theodore Roosevelt, why can't we get presidents like that? Was that <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, when I, yeah, no, when I, I'm, I'm uh, just, I'm just, that's a phrase that I just throw out there. Why can't we get presidents <laughs> like that? That's all right. When I testified to Congress in 2009 for the NFL concussion hearings, I mean that, that's actually what I ended my testimony with, was there needs to be another commission for football, because you kind of look at who's supposed to really be in charge of football, and all the incentives are way out of whack. I mean, it's either the NFL making billions, or even you go down the line, the official governing body of youth football, USA football, mm -hmm. is funded by the NFL. There's nobody just looking out for the kids. And if you look at who's going to pick up the pieces when this is all over, who's paying for all these guys coming down with dementia in their 50s, it's us. And it's going to be through Medicare, and it's going to be through federal costs. And so the, the reality is that the federal government does have a reason to step in. And when you look at other public health issues, we do in terms of smoking, in terms of lead paint, in terms of mercury exposure, protecting children from things that will affect them later on. And it's not crazy to put brain trauma in there. I, I was doing an interview this morning. If you think about the history of youth, youth sports, you know, you go talk to 70-year-old NFL players, and they say they didn't play till 12. There was no youth football. This is a new experiment. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're finding out is the experiment wasn't maybe such a great idea. And, you know, if you used to hit kids in the head a thousand times every fall, if they were six years old, it only came in the form of abuse, and that was penalized. Now, as long as it's two six-year-olds hitting each other, Let's all have a party and have a barbecue around it. 
And how many of those six-year-olds would actually say they really enjoy it? <laughs> right, though? Yeah, no. They'd rather no one wrestle, enjoys football but football practice. Right. <laughs> that is true. Um, so you, can, you can also see, I think, colleges, for uh, all their well-intentioned uh, programs, they certainly see football as a money-making machine. All these amalgamations of conferences, everybody realigning, people like Boise State getting in the Big East, uh, just from financially, it's it's all about, you know, it's less about protection. It's all about climbing up to a higher level of play, where just about the Southeast Conference is the f is the feeder for the NFL. So it's just about climbing up to a higher level of play, uh, more television revenue, uh, such as BC going to the ACC, such as UMass playing schools like o Ohio U this weekend, or playing at Gillette Stadium. I mean, what kind of a college experience is that when you go play at Gillette Stadium? I mean, don't you want to play on campus? But this, it's just stuff like that that that's driving the, the bus. You well, you know, well, we're, you know, the, the, the part about the NCAA that's really relevant here is that, we, you know, we're actually, in a, through a sports legacy institute, in a little bit of a fight with them uh, because what was interesting, a move the NCAA made was that when we battled the NFL and they finally said, all right, the head injuries do cause problems. They made a poster and they hung it in the locker rooms that basically closed their legal liability. And it says, if you get hit in the head, you may experience depression or memory problems or early onset dementia. It's full disclosure from CDC language. NCAA copied that poster as part of their concussion education program and removed all of the long-term language, all of it. it. There's basically concussions will cause a headache and you may have to, you know, and you'll see butterflies and it won't be so bad and don't worry about it and come back and play and help, help your coach make five million bucks a year. So the idea now that we not only disclose the risk, they don't pay them, they don't let them go to class, and yet everyone's making money off them, is reaching a point where they are now going to, I think this is going to, this is the biggest threat to the whole exploiting college athlete system. I hate the NCAA. I think you're <laughs> evil organization on so many levels. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> I won't. I'll, dig I'll right enjoy in. what's go, coming in November. Go right Thanks, in. Bob. Go right <clears throat> in. Yeah. Uh, I'm Dominic Ann. I'm a board member. I introduced you guys. And Taylor, thank you very much for coming as well. I'm a Rev season ticket holder, actually. I had the privilege to watch you play a lot. and really Good player, wasn't he? Your awesome player. Yeah. Great place. Thank look, you. If only you had a better look, so he'd be really. <laughs> and by the way, yeah, you yeah. scored a goal on that last concussion, right? I did. Yeah, I was thank there. you. Yeah. Thank you. See, it was worth it. <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> now I've got a headache the rest of my life, but at least I scored. Was a, uh, <laughs> so I, I actually, you touched on a little bit, Taylor, about FIFA and maybe taking them on. And, and you know, I know baseball's gone to this seven-day DL con for concussions, and some of the major uh, governing uh, programs are taking this on. But who do you think's really leading the charge? And will, are there anybody, is anybody resistant about it? Are there legal issues they're concerned about? Or what, what's the resistance other than you know, being macho or something and not wanting to address that this is a problem in all sports? Well, you know, I'll speak on behalf of the sport of soccer. The EPL doesn't recognize concussions. Um, you know, you'll have fans hit me up on Twitter saying we don't have them over here. Well, they also didn't have shin guards until we created shin guards. So my response to that has always been, listen, it's not a bad thing. We're recognizing what we athletes have felt. We now know what it is, what the injury is, and how can we stop it. Um, I don't know what will happen in the sport of soccer because I know the biggest fear is the heading aspect, and people are worried, well, if, you know, if it's heading, we can't really, you know, if it's the helmets in football, it's, it's the heading in soccer, what do we do? We can't really get rid of that. So what's our next goal? You know, what, what do we do? Um, for the baseball thing, and I've had, I literally, I was late. I, again, I'm sorry, I was late. Uh, we were having our concussion committee discussion on the phone for MLS. And we brought up the seven day DL and the 15 day DL. The problem with the injury, and Chris, you can talk about this, everyone's different. So Sidney Crosby has a bad concussion. It technically, it was only his third diagnosed concussion in his life, and it took him 19 months to come back with it. And then there's guys like Eric Lindros, there's guys like myself, there's guys that have had seven or eight. I don't know how many you had. I ten, I had four this summer. See, he had four this summer, there you go, he had ten. So you can't, it's not a knee of, hey, he's got his ACL, here we go. It's the same for everyone. And I think that's the toughest thing because 
There are athletes that get concussions. They're fine in 48 hours. You know, and if they treat it the right way, I, that's a different discussion whether 48 hours is enough. But I don't think we'll ever see in soccer that mandatory, we need to have this amount, this amount, this amount of rest because everyone's different. Let's take it. Can I take this over here? I know you're still waiting. Hang in. Go ahead. <coughs> Thank you. Ed Hart. Uh, ahead of you anyway. I'm a pediatric neurologist and have dealt with head injuries and rehab for, well, it's 49 years that I've been doing this, more or less. Uh, you should be sitting here. Well, no, no. Uh, uh, just a couple of comments. One is in terms of the influences that um, encourage return to um, uh, play, which is often what I'm faced with. Uh, can they go back in and play? Well, it's not so much the neurology, it's the individual himself. I'm going to lose that scholarship chance if you don't let me go in and play, no matter how big an injury it was or how much they're going to hide what's going on, as you alluded to. And, and uh, you know, I'd like to see the elimination of college uh, sports uh, concussion, uh, sports co scholarships, rather. I always try to get them to, um, I'm always on the side of the mother, by the way, not the father. But, um, you know, I said, well, what about the chess team, you know, and the interest in that. And they don't come back to me, actually, uh, <laughs> maybe for that reason. And uh, just one brief, well, first of all, concussion is any uh, change in neurological functioning. It's not... Uh, and being knocked out, as was uh, often thought. So it's any, any change as a result of an injury that, that alters neurological functioning is now considered to be a concussion. In terms of these pressures, I'm going to just tell you one anecdote. A uh, young man who, in skiing, you know, went off a cliff and had a, uh, a blood clot in his brain and operations or whatever, and I was seeing him at some point afterward. His father is the head of one of the major departments at my hospital, and, and I said, you know, all things considered, maybe take up chess or whatever, and the mother's nodding her head. The father says, uh, he's got my genes, goddammit, and he's going to go back in and play. He's, and needless to say, he's not a cognitive therapist like myself, a, a physician, he's a surgeon, uh, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> and a little shot at surgeons. Yeah. <laughs> But not undeserved. Yeah, but what if he falls off his chair playing chess? Mm -hmm. Still get a concussion. Yeah. It's dangerous. Right? Yeah. Well, thank it depends on how you play. Not well. as much torque. Thank you for sharing that. That was helpful. So I'm Dr. Hill. I'm a chiropractor. Uh, first, I want to clarify one thing. The human brain doesn't fully develop till 25, not 14. There you go. Um, That's uh, my issue. Uh, <laughs> Yours peaked at 14. <laughs> mine, mine was at 14. That's a uh, problem. The only thing is, one thing, a suggestion with soccer, just as an aside, is John Henry now owns, you know, one one of the major soccer leagues, and he's a Bostonian. I wouldn't, maybe the idea is maybe to approach him to approach the, um, the federation. The John Henry doesn't hold a candle to Michael Platini in FIFA. So. I have no idea, but that was a. Right, that's like um, FIFA and the IOSC, IOSC, the NSCAA, as Chris knows, it's, it takes more than just one John Henry. Then I'm going to ask you something. You don't have to do this. I was just very curious that if both of you would stand up and just stand normal and close your eyes for me with your hands at your side, I'd be very curious to see what happens. <laughs> now, that's private information. <laughs> yeah, HIPAA, HIPAA? HIPAA? is not allowed. HIPAA. I'm good. <laughs> share that that's information. HIPAA. I'm good. Okay. Why? What do you expect to happen? Well, normal people would just have a little bit of a sway, and um, people with a concussion, I, I think, would have a little different sway than the average person who doesn't have a concussion, because you have you have three different fluids in your body. You have you know blood, which everybody knows about, lymph, which some people know about, and then you have your cerebral spinal fluid, which which pumps between your brain and, and your sacrum, and that pumping mechanism is affected when people have concussions, and when they, you close your eyes, it, it affects and that sway motion. What would happen if you get, what would? I, I actually did this a week ago uh, for my checkup, and I'm back to normal, okay. which is a huge one. But uh, two years ago, I fell over, and my right shoulder hit the wall. So I, I'm pretty Chris, familiar with that. Yeah, had four this summer. Why? why did I, I, when he said that, I, I said, know. why? Had four this summer? Why do you get, you get back in the ring? What happens? <laughs> Why are you doing that? Yeah, you're I'm doing I, yeah, everything I'm, you're telling people not to I'm, do. I'm playing in an old man basketball league, and they are deteriorating yeah, faster. Yeah, but so is Bob. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. I can't dunk quite as much as Bob. <laughs> and they can't control their elbows. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, I think they were just mad because I was scoring so much. But um, <laughs> no, I, I, I got it was four like one in a million shots. It was you know an elbow to the head because uh, on a close game, one, a ball I shouldn't have gone for because it was a close game. Then my dog head butted me uh, and got a quick rotational torque off of small things. I wasn't expecting it because he's huh? usually very friendly. Kind of uh, dog. <laughs> to whip it, about <laughs> 40 pounds. He was jumping on someone. I put him on my lap and he went. Uh, and then uh, the fourth one. What happened on the fourth one? Oh, I got a, it. Was a it was a ball to the head that should not have been there. So uh, well, it wasn't a jumping the in the ring. The key was okay. no, I'm not in the ring yet. Okay. But uh, the key was I did take cognitive rest for a couple of days. They all happened on Friday, so I slept through the weekend, Good. and then uh, didn't work out for a couple of weeks on each. So I was able to bounce back on each. Though I think the fourth <laughs> it's been a little harder, surprisingly, in four months. Like, so you have a headache today. You have a headache today? I'm actually, I'm turning the corner oh, here. Oh, nice. Congratulations. Yeah, thank Enjoy you. it. Uh, yes. Hi, I don't have a completely clear qu uh, question, but I'm, n I'm not a big sports person, but I have two sons um, who, you know, 17-year-old daughter, whatever, you know, they can also give lots of pressure. And I just wanted to hear just a general brief 101, you know, of, like, of concussions. Like some of the stuff you've been saying, I don't, you know, I don't have the foundation for what you're all talking about. Um, so whatever you wanted to say just briefly that I can think about with my sons would be helpful. Oof. So Are they active? I, that's a long one. <laughs> I go, hold on. Hey, hold on. welcome. Well, uh, let's start, we'll, we'll start with, if I may. You, this is your, right up your wheelhouse. Go thanks, ahead, my thanks. man. Thanks, thanks. Um, you know, when, you, when you're talking about children this young, you know, the first thing you really have to be thinking about is educating them to understand when they have concussions themselves. Because the, one of the problems is you dig through the data and you realize even, you know, there, I'll give you an example. Um, there was a hockey study that was published two years ago, ice hockey, 15 to 19 year olds who theoretically should know when to speak up. They had an athletic trainer in the stands uh, all, they had an athletic trainer for every team, and they took half the league, said, you do your athletic trainer. The other half, we're going to put a doctor in the stands whose job is only to look for concussions. And if they see one, they're allowed to pull the player out, evaluate them, and if they have one, they're out. In this group, they found a 5% concussion rate like we find in every sport on the diagnosed side. In this group, with just an aggressive doctor, it was a 35% concussion rate. One out of three kids that season hmm. were diagnosed by a physician. And then you look at other studies and find you can only see half of the hits that cause them. They put people in a stance hitting checks when they think they saw a concussion. They only catch half. So the problem with exposing young children to that much brain trauma where they have a huge risk of concussion is that we're going to catch one out of 10, one out of 20. And what we're asking them to do to bring those numbers up is to understand that, well, you need to recognize when you have one and you need to sit out and you need to take time to recover. Better to miss a game than to miss a season. I've been digging around as we build our concussion checklist for, for Sports Legacy. There is not a validated educational program for people under high school. There's never been a, and, and I asked some of the experts about this, and they said, well, you know what, it's really hard to come up with educational programs that work online for children to teach them concussions. So we don't even have something I could show your son uh, to teach him what to learn that's been proven to effectively teach him when I get hit and I feel these things, I'm going to tell mom. So we'll start just, you know, that's just down the list of the number one thing is you've got to make sure you know what's going on. You've got to make sure as best you can that he knows to speak up because if he doesn't speak up, you don't have a chance. Then you've got to make sure your coach isn't putting them into situations they shouldn't, like throwing, you know, kicking balls that they expect them to punt that's never going to come up in real life that shouldn't be done. Um, they're, you know, just, you know, one of the things we're pushing through SLI is something called a hit count with the idea of being we've got brain trauma sports backwards. We have limits to often you can throw a baseball. You have a pitch count. This is the best analogy out there. Uh, where if you're 10, you can throw 65 times. If you're 12, you can throw 75 times. And then your son has to stop, and his coach has a clicker. And if he, let, if he exceeded those limits, your coach would lose his job. And then if he throws 61 times, he has to take three days to let his elbow recover. We look at this from the neuroscience side and go, are you kidding me? We have the safest country in the world for a young boy to have an elbow. For and a rotator the most cuff. dangerous, <laughs> the most dangerous to have a brain because there's no limits on how often you can hit. There's no mandated rest for a day you get hit in 100 times, even though we know we're missing the concussions. So, um, so we're, we're actually putting together an experts conference, conference uh, on October 25th to develop a real number because the technology is now there to have a sensor that will tell you how frequently you're getting hit and how hard and say, you know what, there's no longer should we have days where high school football players take 2,235 blows to the head. 
Um, so, I mean, it's, it, it's hard to answer that question slowly. I mean, a lot of the answers are here. You can really think about it or online. Uh, go to but, the movie. Or go to the movie. Go to the movie. <laughs> but, pardon? Oh, it's going to be it's going to be here in Boston. It'll be uh, spaces TBD. It's going to be small though. We're trying to get about 50 people together to really hash this out and then do another conference in the spring that'll be larger. What sports is your son? What sports do you play? Uh, football. How old is he? 18 and a half. Uh huh. Now when can he start football? Well, flag football that was temporary. Um, started this fall. Now would flag, why would flag football be any safer? Well, I don't think <laughs> it, it would be. It is. Oh yeah, totally. Because again, there's no there's no purposeful head contact. Yep, got it. It's all accidental and it's rare. And you Actually. still learn the fundamentals of being a skilled player, yeah. wide receiver, quarterback, running back. You is still he, learn it. You okay with flag football? Yeah, y young man. Let me let me give you a little advice as someone who played a little time. Uh, everybody, half the guys I met played with in college, and a lot of the guys I know from the pros didn't play till high school. Yep. And that actually, they think that gave them longevity because there's only so long you can play a game that violent. So uh, even, even e my mom didn't let me play till high school, worried about my knees and elbows, but I thank her for not letting me do it for my brain. Um, th and I always point out there's lots of things that kids want to do that look really cool on TV uh, that you, won't, don't, wouldn't, you wouldn't consider letting them drive home because uh, you think, it's, or to smoke a cigarette. I mean, brain trauma, he's going to get 1,000 hits to the head, 500 hits to the head every fall you let him do this with an eight-year-old brain. We're not it's trying not to scare idea. you or anything. <laughs> well, just, just try to put some sense into it. You know, football's a great game, but it's a great game for adults. Yeah, and I'm not sure where it is for kids right no, now. No, that was your Hey, how, how old are you, bud? Eight and a half? What else do you like? Football, what else? Uh, you don't want to be yeah. the next Taylor Twelman? Hey, no, play it all. You know what I mean? You don't have to play football right now. Play football, flag football, play baseball, play it all. You're eight and a half. The trouble is, they plenty have so of time, much, my man. There's so plenty much slotting at this age that you either have to choose between lacrosse, or you choose between soccer, or you have to choose between football. You, you know, it's like crazy. Play it all is not a concept anymore. No, play but it all, kids still do it. Can't. You know what? You can say that. Play it all doesn't exist anymore, Taylor. I mean, I'm telling you, even with even with girls. You know, they have to choose between field hockey, soccer, or whatever, or lacrosse. Am I wrong? I mean, isn't everything is in, on a track now? You have to. With certain sports. I wouldn't agree, Bob, with all. Football encourages, encourages you to play other sports. Baseball encourages you but to what play about, other sports. Okay, when the seasons overlap, right. that's where the problems are. I mean, not, at, people, not at eight and a half. Not at, I mean, yeah, not what's the half. problem? I, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I do think there's a lot of slotting at eight and a half, too. I mean, I think that. Well, that's kind of like if you're talking about club level or mm -hmm. in school. Right. Because I was in school, my own started around six. And when I was eight, I was still in the volleyball and volleyball. No exceptions. Right. You couldn't play anything else after eight. I mean. Well, I, I believe. Yeah, but what's your. Right. What's your breast stroke time? Bet you she's a pretty good swimmer. Mm, Jolly Collins. <laughs> Jennifer, sorry to make you wait. Not at You're all. You're the boss. <laughs> you be up Not at all. Guys, it's good to see you again. Um, I'm wondering if Chris can tell us more about what the Sports Legacy Institute is doing and if Taylor can tell us more about what Think Taylor is doing. You go first because I've been talking too much. All right. Uh, mine's, I met with Chris, the first time we met was, what, three years ago? And it was the first time I had been sick for about, and it's one thing I'd say, I, I wasn't hurt, I was sick. Um, Cause I was really dealing with some tough issues and no one told me what I had. Chris was the first person to actually give me informative answers. Um, and so when I dealt with depression hardcore for about 24 months, I, I thought the only way I could get rid of my own depression was start helping other kids. And when I talked with Chris and studied Sports Legacy Institute, there was the prime example of, listen, this is the information you want. This is very in your face. And a lot of parents came to me and said, you know what, we, we, what do you think? And I said, all right, you know what, I'm going to help Chris by going my message. And that was, listen, I, I, some, there needed to be an example out there of putting information out there about concussions. And the other thing, and Chris said it about 10 minutes ago. Kids need to help each other. 
and there needs to be this, the stigma of concussions is bad, is got to go away. It's okay to have a concussion. I can't tell you how many soccer parents have come to thinktaylor.org scared out of their living mind. We've all in this room have had a concussion at some point. We just now know what it is. But if we change the recognition and rehabilitation of concussions, then we're going to ch change something. Chris is going to change something. I can guarantee you that. The NFL, football, something's going to change because of all the hard work he's doing. But there's 20 million kids playing youth soccer under the age of 14. And that is kind of why I started thinktaylor.org, just to be a resource. Because if I had that resource, I'd still be playing. I would have stopped immediately. I would have sat down. I would have sat in the dark room. I would have fixed things. But we didn't know that. And that's kind of why I started a foundation. And that's why I also enjoy coming up here with Chris, because he jump-started it. It was actually OK to talk about concussions, because Chris and SLI started that. Could you imagine if I was doing this without SLI and Chris Nowinski? There's no way, Bob. Right, you wouldn't be talking. People would be like, this it's a dumb soccer player. Well, you but wouldn't actually, be talking. Oh, Chris Nowinski knows him. Oh, OK, it's OK now. You know, if it wasn't for this work here, it wouldn't allow me to go to soccer parents and say, listen, concussions is bad. This is what we're going to do. We're going to help your kids fix that. Hey, it's OK if you tell your buddy, I think my head hurts. It's OK. Yeah, concussions are one thing uh, as, it's okay. as a descriptive thing. But talking about the symptoms can be something else. Like to talk about depression, not cool. No, but, but does a 12-year-old kid know what depression is? No. no, but he knows I got hit in the head. I got a headache where I, I saw a parent two years ago say, I'll just have an orange and two Tylenol. And I watched it. He got hit in the head, 11-year-old kid. And I'm sitting there going, no, just sit him out. They're going to heal. Those kids are going to be so all right. So the message is we've all, we all have concussions. We all need to recognize what that is. There's two words we use at thinktaylor.org, recognition and rehabilitation. And if I can help in any way of dealing with those two issues, then we're not going to have Chris Nowinski's and Taylor Twelman sitting up here dealing with post-concussion syndrome for the rest of their lives. And you're also doing a lot to help kids who are struggling through with post-concussion syndrome. Though. Right. That's another aspect of your program yes. that is very difficult and very important. I want to ask you Every one of us feels yeah. alone. I need to talk about that, too. Yeah. That's a really well, great Well, that's point. the most. Let me just take a couple more questions. Do I get to talk yeah. about SLI? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> You're a wrestler. I'm just a Yeah, well, I mean, you don't want another yeah, bad knee? No, no absolutely. Okay. Uh, thank you. It's great to have you guys here. And uh, obviously, you're experts because you've all had a concussion. And I guess most of us had, have also. Well, my daughters have had concussions from sports and one just a very bad fall. And I'm maybe trying to get ahead a little bit on you, your discussion, but how do you treat a concussion? Thank you. Good question. I wish so, I knew. <laughs> well, you have protocols that would apply but unless you knew what right i fought it i fought it on my own and i think a good way to answer this is what you did to treat yours and what i what did to treat mine I did right nothing. I did you did nothing <laughs> I, I mean i sat in a dark room for six weeks uh dealt with some s hardcore headaches nausea uh different all those symptoms that you see on the sheet i dealt with them i couldn't get the answer because like you just said I did that to seven different neurologists in this country Robert Cantu who we both know finally said listen here's your best way you're actually doing the right thing sit in a dark room anything I took a journal and the best way I can tell kids is when they come to us at think Taylor I say listen how do you feel here are your symptoms do you have any of these the checklist that we filled out I don't know a million times in our life should go through that Tell your parents every day. But if you're doing something that aggravates it, you know, kind of scrapes that scab, so to speak, stop doing that. But be open about it. Because I think the hardest thing that, and Chris will talk now about, if you don't tell people, then people really can't help you either. Because I, I, I told a lot of people, but people weren't informed. But when I told the informative people, they're like, here's what you have. So there's no treatment. Because what I did was different than what he did. We still have both deal with certain symptoms. And that's what I talked about earlier. If you have an ACL, it's fairly easy to deal with an ACL. We all know what you're going to do. Had that too. Yeah, but your concussion is going to be different than mine. But the yeah. same symptoms, you know, you don't go play PlayStation for three hours. You don't go watch movies. 
you know, parents tell me, oh, he's not playing soccer, so I just let him play Xbox for two hours. I'm like, you're using your brain while you play Xbox. They're like, oh, I never thought of that. Yeah, the, yeah, the catchphrases are, are physical rest and cognitive rest. There you go. And we, we didn't talk about cognitive rest until about two years ago, but that, that's just what he was talking about. Stimulating your, an injured brain causes it to feel worse and prolongs recovery. So when we talk about how do you turn this into programs, it's return to play, which is the first thing we talk about, but the least important, return to school and return to life. And managing those three aspects of a child's recovery, and especially in that first week, making sure they're not overstimulated, after that, it's becoming a controversial area about if you rest too much, you hurt your recovery or you add other problems of depression and feeling bad and all that. So there's got to, you know, they say after a week, maybe you start gearing up a little bit, but uh, that's still gray. I guess I get the impression, you know, you really just have to let it go away. Uh, just wait. Just wait and not use your brain, not do anything uh, mechanical or mathematics or and then right. certainly d no sports. And, and the biggest message that we give people is just that it will get better. It doesn't feel like it today. Yes. You know, I mean, if, you know, after four and a half years when I was going through, I was like, I'm never going to get better. But then you do and you feel good. And then and Taylor's going the same way. You're still on that upward yep. trajectory. So we just got to give these these young people hope to just say, look, we've all been there. It's awful. It, you know, I just there's a study published yesterday saying that post concussion uh, affects happiness. The kids feel just as bad as kids on chemotherapy. It's just that bad. So, um, so that that's the message. Is it a, uh, this is under the stupid question by a sportscaster, of which there have been many. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is it a condition or is it a disease? I know. It's well, not it's a condition that can become a disease. Yeah. Okay. Which and let me lead that to uh, let which me. Which is what SLIs. Study. Yeah, I'll, I'll really circle that back. After all, <laughs> no, it wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah, it was. Uh, so what we're doing uh, with SLI is uh, to go to that earlier question is really education, prevention, policy, and awareness. And then we also partner with Boston University School of Medicine to start the Center for the Study of Traumatic. Now they've had. I've talked to some athletes like Mickey Ward. Yeah. Who's donated his brain? Not yet. Not yet. Of course not. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> that explains the, that explains the conversation I had with Mickey. He's, then. he's Mickey, still got Mickey it. Ward, the fighter. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. He said he was, you know. Yeah, because one of the funny things that we're so we're learning uh, that in some people, for some unknown reason, all these hits to the head lead to a degenerative disease that not everybody gets, but especially when you've been hitting the head for 20 years, you get into a very high risk category, especially boxers and football players and ice hockey players. So, um, so at BU we now have a brain bank that. Uh, has 136 brains in it of, of deceased athletes and military veterans. We have, and most of whom have had this disease. Uh, we have people like Mickey, we have over 500 we're tracking for the rest of their lives. And then we're working on all these programs to actually learn to diagnose this disease in living people. It's a degenerative disease that causes symptoms not unlike Alzheimer's disease, except for the symptoms tend to strike you in your 40s, memory problems, impulse control issues, behavioral issues. And, and, and if it goes far enough, it'll lead to dementia because it's degenerative. We found it in people as young as 17. They see little spots in the brain of a certain type of disease and that just keeps spreading like a brush fire the rest of your life and you can't stop it right now. So that's a big move uh, of what we're doing. So is that we're, you know, I, the way I look at my role is, okay, we can clearly fix this for the next generation. And so SLI puts their resources there into these programs and then, but, uh, I, you know, e either me or the guys I played with or Taylor, the guys Taylor played with, will have to deal with this, some of them. And we need to have a, p a pill someday you can take so that you can stop this uh, degeneration. Well, not only have you scared the parents, you scared the hell out of everybody else in here. <laughs> so. Well, you, you, you should be. If, and if, you, I was, if you're on calls with these families, if you're Jim McMahon's family, right. these people really exist. They're, not, they're the, not a myth. The junior Seau was a different yeah. situation. Right? I mean, well, here, go ahead. He I'm, was my I'm next door neighbor for two years. Really? Can I just take, I'm going to get back to this. I, this gentleman's been sure. standing there for, I, I'm not going to forget Junior <clears throat> Seau. Sure. I'm a neuropsychologist, and so I'm curious about, the part I'm curious about is the assessment that, uh, w what goes on and what doesn't. Um, because as time has passed, it's been uh, talked about in the NFL and things like that, that when someone comes out with a concussion, there's a, an assessment that goes on. And, um, how that something like that goes on a sideline, because when I'm working on assessing somebody for um, neuropsychological problems, it's a couple hours of assessment, potentially longer. And so I'm curious about how, how subtle effects are picked up, because it seems to me that some of the things that both of you experienced, which is that you 
really kind of noticed these problems after multiple concussions. I'm wondering if a different kind of assessment could notice problems after one or two concussions that might uh, help somebody be more cognizant about what they need to do, what they need to do for prevention. So I'm, I don't know whether, first of all, there's more going on in terms of assessment that I'm just not aware of. No. And I'm also curious about whether uh, approaching players and player associations to say, you guys need to get assessed, you know, and, and putting some of the, the focus on helping the players advocate for themselves around uh, those kinds of uh, parts would be helpful, so. Great question, you wanna take it? Um, I, I don't know how they assess it on the sideline um, because I know in my sport, we only get three substitutions. Right. So, you know. <laughs> a huge right. problem. Huge problem. So, it, you know, I get hit in the head, I go over the sideline, they assess me, they gotta make a decision. And they want you back in. They're I'm right. also gonna say, it's not, it's also on the athlete. You know, this is a two way street, but the, the hardest thing is, in, in for instance, mine, I got punched in the face. So most likely there's a, you know, I got a concussion, right? Right. But when you pass all the tests, at that time in 2008 that we had, mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, and that's the other thing too, by the way, back in the day, mine was in 2008. So this isn't like, you know, this is just coming about. The players associations, here's the thing that I find very interesting. Heinz Ward, two weeks ago on NBC, said last year he got hit in the head, got a concussion, grabbed his ankle because he knew that the protocol was to come over to the field and get assessed. So no matter what we do, it's still players need to realize that you can end up like Jim McMahon. And I think that takes time because the more athletes that are going to come out with their post-career <coughs> struggles, but Heinz Ward grabbed his ankle and he said he was seeing butterflies, seeing stars. By the way, he's a wide receiver for the uh, yes. Berg Steelers. Um, let me, let me, yeah. Go ahead. And, and, and you ask a very good question of how, you know, the myth of control. Like, do we have this thing right? We're putting in all these protocols. Um, you, there are two questions that are the sideline assessments any good and are the assessments of the generation or right. cumulative effects of concussions any good? And the answer is really no. Um, the the sideline assessment that's most commonly used and, and came out of the Zurich conference that's now happening again next month in 2008, the SCAT 2, has never been validated to actually work, to be actually sensitive enough to concussion. And it's cumbersome and it's long and it's, it's, it's not very useful. If you just ask enough questions or enough time of anybody, you'll get someone to speak up eventually. Right. Uh, and then with the assessment of is, you know, can you tell the difference between one and two and three and four concussions? We don't have the sense of enough tools yet. And because each concussion is so different, mm -hmm. uh, who knows how you'd quantify that? But I mean, I think the more we're putting, the more inv we're investing this, the more putting people in the research studies and putting them in MRS and DTI, <coughs> we're seeing problems. They put a bunch of soccer players who were in their late twenties, who'd been playing most of their life, into a DTI machine and found those who were common headers. You could see the damage. You could already see it in their late twenties. DTI machine being a diffusion tensor imaging. It's kind of an advanced MRI that shows your axonal tracks. Right. Bob, that. just go yeah. with the acronyms. I okay, go know. with it. Right. <laughs> Sorry, but isn't the isn't the also, isn't the issue also that if you come to the sidelines or no matter what the sport is, they want to prove that you don't have a concussion as opposed to they want to prove that you do. Yeah, but there's also it depends the if there's money involved. Yeah, but the pros. They, the hardest thing for NFL players, they're game checks. All the other athletes, you're on salary. You know, so the hardest thing, if you miss that game check, some t a lot of NFL players, that's the biggest struggle. The one I kind of like so far, I like what the NHL's done, and I've spoken to the NHL current players where they go in the dark room. The hardest thing for me was I was still in the stadium. I had just scored a goal. Your adrenaline's flowing, right? So I don't know, is that my headache or am I really on a natural high where a lot of the NHL guys over the last year have gone into that dark room and said, you know what, actually, I don't feel good. You know, it's kind of calmed it down. Right. But part of that issue is that sport allows it, yes. right? right? You know, and that's the, that's the hardest thing. We, we're dealing with this right now. We can't figure it out because if you use your third substitute in soccer and that when someone gets a concussion, <laughs> now you got to play with a man down, you know, you kind of get that. But it does seem like the NHL players, when they have concussions, they seem to take a lot longer to come back, like Bergeron or Crosby or some... Uh, I don't understand what it is. Maybe it is because they pay attention to it and, and don't bring them back. But it does at least seem as if a concussion, is that's the last thing I you want to hear in hockey. I think it's because the little checks they keep taking, yeah. those are little ones, right? Yeah. And so they're not technically a concussion, but they get checked into the board. So yeah. 
I don't know if that's technically their, you know what I mean, Bob, their second concussion. I, do, I think right. Crosby probably took four in that game. No, they actually have the film of him four days before getting whacked in the head there hard. And actually, after the fact, after he got the second one, said, whoops, I should have told you about the first one. He tried to tough his way through the first one. That's what cost him 19 yeah. months, was not speaking up because he didn't get a chance to sit down and with if, us and realize how much it sucks. And if swiveling is the cause, <laughs> you yeah. can say that there's, uh, obviously hockey is a, it's a huge part of the game. Yeah. yeah, I think equipment's a big part. You said it. I mean, the, their shoulder pads are Kevlar, yeah. which is extremely lightweight. Their soccer shoes, their shin guards made out of Kevlar. If they went back the old way, had real pads that are heavier. By the way, you're not skating as fast because you're not as light. You know, there's certain things I think hockey could do equipment-wise. But, you know, we sit here and talk about this. And I'll raise the question, though. So what do you do? So you, football's going to go away? You know what I mean? Does football go away? Does hockey go away? I mean, smoking's bad for you. It's not, it didn't go away. So what do you, how do you, how do you, this is what I deal with myself every day I wake up. So how do we beat that? Well, a surgeon how do we help people? not going to put a sign on the pads of football helmets. <laughs> Playing football <laughs> can be, in, you know, just hazardous. No, there, is, there is a sign. A there is a the sign. There is a sign on helmets now. A on new helmets sign now? Knox. Yeah, yeah, saying that this can cause, you know, use, you can get yep. concussions and brain injuries with this. And you've seen those new helmets. They're like so packed with, with all kinds of stuff that really probably doesn't make any difference at all. Well, it, it does make a difference. The, the biggest problem with helmets is the better they've gotten, the more they've taken pain away. And the heavier when they become. You, the heavier they become, the bigger they become. But when you had a suspension helmet, it, it still hurt you to hit somebody with your head. But now that you have so much padding, as long as you hit the guy harder and he hits you, you don't feel a thing. It feels like a million bucks. Do you wear your helmet with your dog now? <laughs> <laughs> That's Sir Gore. <laughs> I can, I can stand here while you talk about Junior Sale because I'm interested in that as yeah, well. I'm good, I don't want to lose it. No, we're not going to let's go. Okay. <laughs> but I'm just I'm speaking now as a grandfather of an eight and a half year old who lives in a unnamed suburb where there's a lot of pressure on boys. Could be a lot of suburbs. <laughs> Could be a lot of suburbs. Yes, in many states. Right. But anyway. So I'm just seeing how I can be helpful. And I'm, I, I like the SLI brochure that I picked up out in front, and I like the minimum recommended guidelines. You know, I think those are great. But so I look here and I say, okay, well, require preseason education for coaches. Well, how do I require that? Well, you make, you, you, well. How do what I we, make sure that my Well, what sport is it? What sport is he playing? Training? What sport is he playing? Play a uh, football. Here, I'll, I'll tell you exactly how that happens. It's very easy. It just takes one angry or advocate uh, in, uh, parent or grandparent. Okay. Is the state, there's now a state law, which we really helped push through and Taylor was involved with uh, in a big way to get, uh, now uh, public school coaches have to take annual education on concussions. Mm -hmm. They didn't do drive it down to the lower levels just because from a legislative perspective, they don't really have control over those, those programs in the same way. But we, set, we put it out there in 2010 to say, if it's, good, if it's important for the high school kids, it's absolutely important for the youth kids. And now everyone knows that really is what should be standard. There should be no program that doesn't require that. If your coach's program, your kid's program isn't requiring that, you have two choices. One is you tell them he's not signing up unless you're requiring this free 30-minute training program. And that should be an easy decision for you. If they're not willing, they don't care enough about your kid to do 30 minutes for free, don't, bring, don't give them your kid for two hours a day. And number two is go to the go to your local newspaper yep. and happen to mention. Oh, by the way, they're not even doing the free stuff, mm -hmm. and they will not like the bad publicity. I'd go with find the second change. option. You'll That's the one. Option. The first one won't work as well as the second. Local one. newspaper. <laughs> the second won't work real quick. Yeah, because this isn't school related. This is pop. No, but it's uh, yeah. So, but you can you can get those changes or give them my you know give me their number and I'll call them and. <laughs> We'll I make sure they have. I wonder about. <laughs> I, I wonder about Pop Thanks. Warner if it, if it's safer or not safer. If it if it's not. not I don't. I don't. Simple answer. I don't think there should be Pop Warner. Okay. Well, I guess. You know, I look, we've got. The, what's your name, there. buddy? Josh. Josh, I, I have no problem with playing flag football. And you ask the West Welkers and those guys of the world, flag football still teaches you the fundamentals of the game. Still teaches you how to be a skill player. The kids still get to play the sport they love. Just take the helmets and hitting out of it. What's, it, what's the issue? My, my new favorite piece of data regarding the safety of youth football is uh, we now have sensors and helmets to tell you how hard you're getting hit. 
And we first put those in college athletes and found that the mean hit to the head was somewhere between 18 and 22 Gs. Then we finally put that in a high school team. And then we're surprised to find the mean hit was exactly the same. The theory being, well, it's really not about how much force you bring in. It's also what's on the other side. And if you have this bigger head and weaker neck, it doesn't take much to move it quickly. And that's all the concussion is, is your head moving quickly in space. So then they finally this year put the sensors in seven and eight-year-olds. College mean was 18 to 22 Gs. The seven-year-olds was an average of 15. So they're hitting about 75% as hard as guys over twice their size and tremendously faster. Okay, can you talk, just put the Gs into context. That's your force. The I, 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 times, the times the force of gravity. Yeah. So uh, if you're, you know, we're all living in one force, uh, one, one G. If you sneeze, you feel three. If you're on a roller coaster, you feel five or six. If a concussive hit in football, we'll get over 100. and It'll last for 15 milliseconds. And that, that burst is what causes this disruption to the brain. Um, but that goes against the bigger, faster, stronger. Yeah. Right. It doesn't... It, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Right. Well, though I think it might at the pro level. Yeah. Because what, now they're all much bigger and but, much faster. But if an 8-year-old kid level. like Josh yeah. is still generating 15 to 18, well, don't tell me it's, well, okay, it's bigger, faster, stronger. No, you can still generate it, and he's... 80 pounds. Fascinating. Right. Uh, Junior Seau, which was what we were talking about, uh, I don't want to forget, this was a very unusual case, very tragic case, uh, where the player who played for the Patriots, he played for the San Diego Chargers his whole life, committed suicide. And um, I, I think his family eventually agreed to donate his brain, but maybe you could talk a little bit about this, because the, the last word I had on that was that it was not the result of Concussion. No, that was a fall. I read the same thing. That yeah. uh, that was the autopsy. The brain stuff, and Chris will tell you that those results will take a little bit longer. Um, I'll tell you about my conversation. I was on Sports Center the day after he passed. Yeah, you lived next. Said you lived next. He to was him? my next door neighbor yeah. for the two years here in New England. And when I got punched in the face about three weeks after that, he uh, Junior and I went to dinner, which we did once twice a week. And he said, "But you know, in his funny way, buddy, buddy, why aren't you playing?" And I said, "I, I don't know. I've got a headache." and I can't figure it out, but I think I've got post-concussion. And he goes, buddy, buddy, I've had a headache since I was 15. I can't tell you how many concussions I've had. His medical history in the NFL was zero concussions, diagnosed. So when he passed away, and the writer from Sports Illustrated, and, and I'm drawing a blank, said the same thing. I think it was Trotter, if I'm not mistaken. I remember him saying the same thing. Listen, are we this naive in 2012 that we think a middle linebacker had no concussions? You know, 20 years. in the NFL for 20 years, played through Not to 41. mention college, not to mention high school. Right. right. And the age he gave me was what? Since I was 16. Yeah. So I'm not, I don't know why he, you know, put a bullet in his chest. But for us to sit here and say that, you know, we don't know, he had money problems, all this. Listen, he drove his car off the cliff and it didn't work. And that was eight months before that. The fact is, Junior Sale had a headache since he was 16. He had the audacity on a random Tuesday night to tell a soccer player that he had a headache for since he was 16. Concussions were a 100% part of Junior's problem. No doubt in my mind. I, th I think, uh, you know, it's, we've been, it's important to separate the disease from the act. Yes. Um, Very it, there is well, evidence. What, what act? The, the act of suicide. Okay. The act of suicide in some cases should we should just disappear. Should did he, would he have had CTE? Is he going to come out with CTE? I would bet all your money, all my money, all his money that he has it. I would it would be a miracle if he didn't. Uh, but but when the criti and and we should focus on that. He had a degenerative brain disease that made his life worse and would have made his life dramatically worse in time. The act like a Dave Duerson story. Yep. The the Bears safety. Uh, who took his life and shot himself in the chest, left a note asking for his, his brain to be studied. And his, his issue was, you know, he had headaches, he had all these other problems, but also it had ch his, the, his brain had changed his behavior so that he'd gotten violent with his family and his wife divorced him, his kids wouldn't speak to him anymore. Spent he, money, like, remember? He, he went, to, he made went a lot of money million then, dollars yes. into debt after running a $70 million a year Duerson Foods business for 15 years. He made bad decisions. All His life fell apart and he was alone with no one. Would, like, it destroyed his life besides what he felt. And so th there's a social aspect to, to suicide. And there's, there's also a kid like Austin Trenum, who was 18 years old, got a concussion on a Friday night two years ago in a football game. 
and hanged himself 36 hours later. He would never had a problem in the world. Um, and so... How about the wrestler? Um, a couple years... Benoit ago. killed his family? Yeah. So, we, uh, so I got his brain. That was the first brain we had at Sports Legacy Institute. And because uh, I knew... I had a similar conversation with Chris back in... So I, I started the company in 2002, and Chris Benoit was actually the guy who taught me to throw forearms. When, I was, when he was recovering from his neck fusion surgery, I was in Cincinnati in developmental and threw a really bad forearm. Those forearms are kind of close to. Yeah, like, give him one of these. <laughs> uh, and I, and, and they were, I was wild, and he just said, no, no, just show me what you got, and put my head down, and I was whacking him. He just didn't care. He was, he was willing to give his body for anybody. And then in 2006, when I was working on the book, he was the old, I was still a spokesman for the company, and we were in a locker room in Manchester, and he actually sat down. And he goes, so what, is, so what are you finding here? And I told him some of the stories. He's like, well, how many concussions do you have? And I said, I've had six. And, he, and I said, uh, how many do you think you've had? And he said, uh, I've had more than I could count. And I didn't really realize, and he said, you know, here, take my number and give me a call. And he'd never done that before because uh, he, was, he was a champion, and, and I was nobody. And, uh, and I didn't realize uh, after this all went down, I kind of realized I think it was a little bit of a try for help. So when this happened, uh, you know, because he was a really well-respected guy. When he killed his family, his, his wife, his son, seven-year-old son himself, I knew that there was, his brain must have been a mess. And, and so his, luckily his father let us study it, and he, it, was, it was worse than any of the football players we'd studied really? to that point at 40 years old. Yeah. Let, me, uh, let me ask, I'm sorry. Uh, Pardon? So CT is, is chronic traumatic encephalopathy, a neurodegenerative brain disease. Uh, in the family of Alzheimer's and other ones. Uh, let's take this question, and then I really want, I'm, I'll try to remember what I'm going to talk about next. Go ahead. Taylor and uh, Chris and Bob, thank you for coming and spreading the word. I think this is very important. Uh, I saw the movie last night, rented it on demand. It was uh, great. I mean, educational and, and uh, thought provoking. Thanks. Uh, it's, Excellent job, and congratulations on the award to a best documentary in Boston. Thank you. Saw that correctly. Yep. Um, I'm here kind of for selfish reasons. I played football, Pop Warner, high school, college, and 14 years as semi-pro. I've coached kids and um, an official uh, first year for college and all the way down to Pop Warner. What can a guy like me I could show you my helmets. I didn't bring them with me, but at some time, you know, they're all mangled. Semi-pro, there aren't standards that college has. You know, it's anyone that wants to show up and donate time and sweat and blood and bones. Uh, you feel free to do it. Um, so what can someone like me in my situation do to understand, uh, diagnose, and uh, you know, learn about this uh, disease more and possible treatments and so forth. I've got a four-year-old son at home. I've got two daughters at home. It's really important to me. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, well, yeah, I know what you're thinking. Uh, you know, well, I first say it's not everybody. Um, but right now we don't, we, we don't have a way to diagnose it. We don't have a way to treat it. It's, it Treatment's a few years off. We're, diagnosing won't be, where there's a lot of great stuff going on. Um, I would invite you to enroll in our research program, our longitudinal study, which will allow you to get familiar with not only the work we're doing, but also access to the, the literature. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of learn about you know, what to look for if you are concerned about any early symptoms. We can treat a lot of the symptoms, whether it's memory or whether it's anxiety or whether it's impulse control. That is treatable. Uh, although it doesn't necessarily affect the disease. And so I would encourage you to uh, investigate that if that's something you're interested in. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it's really about becoming part of the solution and, and, and getting involved in research, getting more people involved in research, maybe helping raise money for research because, you know, there's a lot of guys, you know, like you and me and others out there who realize that there might be, a, you know, for some of us, it's a ticking clock. And right. so uh, I'm, I'm be happy to discuss that with you afterwards or, or send me okay. an email to the rest of our lives. And I'll, I'll give you, uh, on top of that, everything he said, do it. Make sure you do it. I'm the, uh, I think I'm still the only male soccer player, right, in the brain? Do no, we people have a couple followed more? you. Yes. You're a leader. Yes, good. We've got more <laughs> brains coming. I'll tell you what I did. Um, I kept that journal for eight months. 
and it really helped me try to figure out my life. How can I survive? How can I go to, I didn't go to a movie for over three years. Um, I, it was very difficult to go to a bar, watch a game, but I kept a journal to try to learn, okay, these things trigger certain symptoms, these things don't. But I also researched diet, and, and I've done hardcore omega-3s, and in the last six months, my headaches have gone down 75%. I can play 36 holes, and you know, it's controlled my symptoms. Mm -hmm. There's a way you can, you know, it's not gonna cure it, like Chris said, but there's a way where, you know, maybe you wanna go see Fast and Furious and you get a headache. Well, maybe if you change a couple things in your life, maybe you can go see that movie you wanna do, or you wanna go watch the Patriots in a bar and not get a headache. I think there's things. I, be proactive, try to fight it. You know what I mean? To real study your life and say, okay, this bothers me. Lights like this, like Bob and I, you know, it's warm up here. Two years ago, there's no chance I'm sitting here. I'm telling you right now, I'd see two of you. So that's worked for me. So I sh don't sit there and just say, no, I'm not gonna do it. Cause when I met Chris three years ago, he motivated me to say, you know what? Let's get after it, right? And I found a way. So omega-3s work for me. It's really changed my diet. I've completely changed my diet. I don't need to wear sunglasses anymore. I think, I think you can do it. So don't lose that fight, become very educated on it, but also, be proactive, study it. This has been part of a long process. So I took the family to the Museum of Science about 18 months or so ago and they had a, just a booth at the escalators where they showed football helmets and pressure rates and that's what started this whole path. I've followed you pretty much since then. That's why I followed the movie and Facebook and all that kind of stuff to see what you're up to. And On I demand, hope. right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Guys, we're just about Thank to wrap you. up, but I think we've got one more question. I have one two more, more question. We have two more. And that two more, then we're good. Yes, hi. Um, we'll make it quick. I play on the hockey team here at Suffolk. So um, two years ago before I came here, um, I played juniors, and literally no one was diagnosed with concussions. And my freshman year here, eight to ten kids were diagnosed with concussions and it's probably one of the most like severe things that we're ta like we're starting to take very seriously on the team uh in the organization period there's actually three kids who can't play hockey anymore because of how many concussions they've come down with so i just want to say thank you guys so much for uh promoting this awareness and getting uh sports teams more involved to take awareness because if not like severe like injuries could come out from it uh but also being a hockey player, uh, this year they were trying to pass uh, the NCAA because we have we still wear full cages and playing college hockey. So um, they're trying to remove that to just have uh, either visor or no shield at all uh, because of the gladiator effect that it causes. So do you feel that more equipment po uh, would po uh, pose more problems? Uh, like especially you're talking about the helmets adding more padding and everything, don't you think that would make kids feel more invincible and that would increase the concussion rate as opposed to reduce it? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think the, the, more, the less pain you feel from collisions, the more likely to put yourself in positions you wouldn't normally, especially your face. You know, the, the foot problem with football wasn't that they made the helmet, it was what they made the face mask. Mm -hmm. Because you could, when you still get hit in the face, you, you tackled like this. But when you, you, know, you covered it up, so I think hockey players should be happy to trade teeth for their brain. Yeah, I was going to take care of the face <laughs> and everything first, and then you'll learn to take care of your head. Yeah, um, start to get some scars again. You're too pretty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so going off that, uh, I'm also just trying to like, uh, build like, the educational awareness for uh, student athletes uh, because as it's getting a concussion as a student athlete is very tough because not only do you have to deal with being on the team, but in the classroom. Do you have any advice or anything to do uh, anything that would help uh, students uh, move forward, especially student athletes that receive concussions in the classroom or how they can handle studying and being a student as well. This is more up your alley, right? What do you think, Ted? Yeah, I mean, the one thing is I've never, I've come across a couple times telling parents that, you know, see the neurologist, neuropsychologist, get the letter from the doctor, so forth and so on. Teachers are now open to it. You know, whereas in 2008, 2009, teachers are like, well, the kid's got a headache or whatever. The biggest thing is they need to learn the symptoms. They need to learn when they read their textbook for 40 minutes, there's a reason why they have a headache. It's not because the calculus is too difficult. I think when most kids and students, whatever it is, learn the symptoms, 
That's what it did for me. I now knew that I wasn't depressed because I didn't go to England. I was depressed because when I watched 20 minutes of television, I got a real bad headache and a pain behind my eyes. The symptoms awareness is the biggest way you can do it. And then be open. People need to be open. You know, I don't feel good, or I think I hit my head, or I, I, be open about it, because right now, we're all sitting in here. Concussion's at the highest. It's only going to get higher. Everyone's aware of it. They don't know what to do, but be open about it. Okay. You sound like Teachers will be very appreciative. You have an enlightened program here already at Suffolk when it comes to hockey. Yeah, sounds good, yeah. Yeah, that's Let's great. Let's take this question in, in our last with the asterisk. Yeah, I'll make it quick, thanks. Um, can you just comment a little bit more on where the use of technology, I know you mentioned like the brain scans of current athletes and diagnosing and then maybe helping them uh, get back on the field at the appropriate time. You know, it could be a week, could be three weeks, could be 19 months, it depends on the person. Are we far off from actually being able to have uh, not just professional athletes where their teams can pay for those equipment, but bringing it down to the youth, not you know, the, down the level to high school, college, co college, high school youth. You know, I'm, I'm sure it costs money to do scans on brains, and obviously that's probably why it's not implemented, but right. is that somewhere, a direction that they're eventually going to go, and how far off are we? But Chris, are there scans, though? Because I never, when I was... No, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing great or validated. I mean, there's some interesting research using some things that yep. we'll see things that we haven't seen before. Right. But I think, you know, what you're asking for is an interesting problem we have here, which is you need to get something that's actually going to reach the people who need it the most, which are the youngest people with no infrastructure, no resources, no money. You have to go incredibly low tech. And most everyone's looking into high tech and expensive because there's money to be made there. Uh, there is one test that I think in a, in a year or two will be widely used and adopted quickly uh, if it passes a couple other research hurdles. And that's called the King Devic test, which is a repurposed dyslexia test. It's called rapid number naming. It's literally an index card with the sp numbers spaced funky, where you, your eye tracking slows down when you're, when you're concussed and your cognition slows down. And this assesses a lot of your brain just by reading numbers out loud. And they find that, and they've, they've been testing this at Penn, and they've been testing it at a few other places, and find that everybody slows down when, you know, from your average of 40-second baseline to, you know, 42, 45, 50, 60. And if that, th they're trying to find out if coaches can assess people just as well as parents can. And it's so low tech that with the right training program, they probably can. And then they're trying to find out how sensitive it is because neuropsych tests don't necessarily work the younger you go. But t stuff like that may be on a sideline soon where you can actually have some level of confidence that if you are worried about a, an athlete getting concussed, you give them this test, you find out they're slower, and you can hold them out, and you actually have something that's really validated. And they're starting to use it on every athlete in some studies coming off the field, and they're spotting concussions they didn't spot. They're like They've had a couple kids come off the field, and they're like, wow, you're really slow in your test. Did you have a concussion? And they're like, I don't remember playing the game. But they never brought it up. They just didn't speak up. Well, I want to thank you guys. You guys have been Thanks. great. Big uh, hand for Chris. our speakers. Chris Nowinski's book, Head Games, is on sale right now in the lobby. And I'm sure if you buy one, you can bring it back and he'll sign it for you. Please go out and get a, a copy of Head Games. It's a great book. Thanks for coming tonight. Thanks.